We're on number 37 of the 48 ways to wisdom. And it reads in the list, it reads, Eno, Megis, Libo, Betamudo. It doesn't satiate his desire in his studies. Now, what does that mean? When your desire is satiated in a novel, then you know what you are? You're bored. Yeah, you had enough. In order to live, in order to use your potential, you have to learn not to be bored with living. Living is not boring. <laughs> right? Right, now, we all understand what we got to do. We got to be fascinated with this process of wisdom, of understanding, of living, of learning how to have pleasure. We got to be fascinated constantly. All right, so to focus your attention on the difficulty of the job, so I would suggest that think for a moment, imagine that uh, you lost your eyesight for the last uh, three years, yeah. and now you got a doctor, and he cures you. Do you realize how fascinated you will be? with just being able to see. Right now, you're bored with seeing. If there's nothing else to do, to look, to look at the woodwork and see the colors and the lines, not unless you're an artist and you try to copy it, then you'd be fascinated. You'd be seeing what you saw. So look, you can turn it on, you can turn it off. Yeah, can you imagine? You're stuck on the beach. You've got nothing to do. All that you can do is look around. <laughs> Boring. There must be a way that we can turn it around and be fascinated with things that are fascinating. The idea is keep setting yourself in ways that will keep you fascinated. And so number one about how to go about it is you have to focus and you have to know that whatever you know, whatever you understand about living, you haven't even begun, you haven't even started. There's so much to understand about this process of living. That's what you have to focus on. Realize there's so much to understand about love, about meaning, about pleasure, about using your own potential. You haven't even begun to use your own potential, to know yourself. That's the basic focus you have to get. Okay, so number two of this is that to see what we mean by this, take a concept that we've been dealing with a hundred times already. The last row of, of things was, oh, be beloved, be loved by others, love the place, love creation, love righteousness, love the straight way. So the last five ways, we defined and redefined love five times, maybe ten times, right? So you remember the first time we defined love. You know that you can define love? Did you have any? In Judaism, we have a commandment, love your neighbor comes with definition. The Almighty doesn't tell us to do something that you don't know what to do. <laughs> it's very fair. You, would you tell your children to do something they don't know what you're talking about? They wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't they know, know what to do. The Almighty is very considerate. He doesn't just tell us to love each other. He gives you a definition. What is love? He gives you a how. He's a very fine daddy. Yeah? He means business. He knows where we are. We'll make the mistakes. We'll tell our kids... Cheer up, you got everything to live for. And they're, they're depressed. And we'll say, it's up to you. I told you the truth. <laughs> you know, cheer up. Right? But the Almighty doesn't do that. He tells us, be happy. He teaches us. He gives us a definition. What is happiness? How to do it? And he tells you, go to work. It's up to you. All right, at any rate, we have a commandment, love. So it comes with a definition. It's fascinating to hear that there's a definition. So what's the definition? And those of you who hear it the first time will find it fascinating. Those who've heard it already five times, right? Oh, and here it comes again, right? Right? Here it goes. They are set your mind. You gotta listen one more time. <laughs> and that's what goes on. Those who've never heard it, wow, definition for love. Fascinating. Hey, want to hear? What do you say, Andy? You, you, you want to skip this part? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. I heard it. All right. The definition for love is it's an emotion. That we all agree on, right? It's an emotion that we have. And it's a pleasurable emotion. When you don't focus on the problems. Yeah? But just when the person that you love walks into the room, you get a surge of pleasure. Right? What is that pleasure caused by? The reason we say that pleasure is caused by seeing virtue in another human being, noticing, understanding, and appreciating Virtue, beauty, good, power, 
and another human being and identifying him with that virtue. That's the definition of love. Now, you've got to check it out. Don't accept what I'm saying. But you love someone? Ask any man. You love your child? We love our children. That's the easiest form of love. He says, sure, I love my son. What do you love about your son? Well, he's intelligent. He's full of life. He's full of vitality. He's a good kid. He's always ready to do a favor. He's, he's got charm. He, everything good that he can think of, he's going to list it. Yeah? You say, well, isn't it true that this kid is a hypochondriac? Yeah. He's always sickly. He's always complaining about his health. Isn't it true? Tell me. You can't say, yeah, I love him, that hypochondriac. Yeah. But what he'll say is, he excuses his fault, and he'll say, well, if he was a sick kid, and uh, he got, he's worried about his health. I mean, if you had that situation, you'd also be hypochondriac. You understand? He excuses his fault, identifies him with his virtue. If you hate someone, you identify him with his fault, and you excuse his virtue. You say, why do you hate this guy? Well, he's a two-timing rat, a slimy, selfish. Well, isn't it true that he's very intelligent? You can't say, yeah, I hate him. He's so intelligent. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't jive, right? You say, so what? You say, that's an excuse for being a two-timing rat. Because you're intelligent, it's okay. You excuse his virtue, and you focus on his fault. You identify him with his fault. Am I making sense? Yeah? All right, so that's fascinating. And that teaches us already a little bit how to love. You want to work at loving? Look for virtues. Appreciate virtues in another human being. Focus. That's the real human being. His faults are accidents, are mistakes. And you love. You'll take pleasure in human beings. The idea of number two is realize the first time you see, you hear that concept, it's fascinating. Once you've heard it twice, three, five times, boredom. I've heard it too many times already. How many times am I going to hear it? Do you see that contract? Yeah? Okay. Number three is realize that's wrong. Don't be bored. You're making a mistake. You don't understand what we're talking about. Love is an emotion of pleasure. You don't understand. It's an emotion of pleasure that we have when we see virtue and another human being and identifying with that virtue. I don't see anything new. No, no, no. Take it on faith. You haven't even begun. You don't even understand it. Yeah. Number four is, let's illustrate that we haven't begun. Let's go over it again, step by step. Love is an emotion. An emotion, right? Of pleasure. Okay, what other emotions do you know? You know, people do an act of bravery. Yeah. That's one act of bravery. Anybody can do it. Then there is a man who's brave. There's an emotion courage or being brave and there's a person who is brave right there's an emotion a person can do an act of kindness he feels kindly he'll do he'll do you a favor and there's a person who is kind do you see the difference there's a moment of an emotion there's an act that is instigated by an emotion and then there is a person who has assimilated this emotion and he's a kind person he's a brave person Right? Is there such a thing as a person who loves and a person who is a lover? That's right. And you can be a lover. Yeah. But what's the process? You see, you're opening up a new avenue of, of investigation. How do you become a lover? How does a person become brave? How do you become a kind person? Everybody will do an act of kindness, right? Then there are people who are kind, who are generous. Anybody can do an act of generosity, can be overtaken by the spirit of generosity, right? And then there are individuals who are generous. They are generous. Anybody can love. Then there are people who are lovers. Ah. But do you see a new aspect? And we, we talked about an emotion. And now we see a new dimension to it. All right, let's take it to the next step. Love is an emotion of pleasure. What's the pleasure? You see, when we eat an apple, we eat a fruit, we, we know what, what, what the pleasure is. It's the taste buds. Yeah? What's the pleasure of seeing beauty in another human being? What changes? What is affected? The heart, feeling, the soul. Your soul is affected. How is it affected? You know what the pleasure is? You become kind. You become brave. You're lifted. 
your soul is lifted. You change. And that's the pleasure of life. When you see somebody who's got courage, vitality, and life, you feel alive. Courage, vitality. Your soul partaking. That's what love is. You're, you're actually partaking in that virtue. Yeah. Appreciating it is partaking in it. It's, it's growing in that aspect. Isn't that a fascinating thing? Come on. Do you agree that it's true? Of course it is. It tells us something about it. All right. It's an emotion of pleasure that we have when we see. When we see, notice, appreciate. Now, why is it that in our children we see it? In a stranger, we don't. In our parents, we see it. And in our friends, we don't. What, what makes us see? If you see, you see. If you don't see, you don't see. If you discovered that a fellow who's in this room is a long-lost brother, would you all of a sudden notice that he has virtues you haven't noticed before? You'll see it. What makes us see? And what keeps us from seeing? Things that are obvious. See, it's the body that doesn't feel like it. The soul is always interested in pleasure. When we identify, the body doesn't stand in the way. Our son, our brother, hey, that's my brother. Mm. The body's there with you. Yeah? Identify. Flesh, blood. <laughs> yeah? What's the difference? If it's pleasurable, it's a nice guy, it's a nice guy. True. What's the difference? You might as well enjoy it. But the body says, nah, come on. Let's get out of this. Yeah. Well, if it's your own, the body doesn't interfere. It's interesting, fascinating. That's the idea that I'm trying to illustrate. I'll take it one more step. And love is an emotion, pleasure that we have when we see virtue. Yeah. Virtue in another human being. Now, is there a different pleasure in each virtue? The pleasures come with flavors. You know, is the pleasure of loving a man who's courageous different than the pleasure of loving a human being who is kind or another human being who is understanding? That's right. Different flavor. It's a different pleasure. You're affected differently. It's not all the same. It's not all the same at all. Anyway, what I'm trying to illustrate here is a concept that is boring to you. If you've got the right tools, you can turn it into a fascinating study, right? And opening new dimensions, new dimensions in living, new dimensions in appreciation, new dimensions in pleasure, new dimensions for your potential. Uh, number five is that we got to appreciate that what we were using here to open up this concept, of this definition of love, is just one of the 48 ways. It's just one of the tools of the 48 tools. It's called Shoel Umesha. It's analyzing. It's asking questions and answering. It's analyzing. What are you talking about? Never be bored. Any one of the tools will open up anything that you do and give it new dimensions, new color, new power. That's what the 48 ways is really about. And number six is that the easiest one to use, that you don't need any any uh, professionalism, it's very much like the artist. Try to make a drawing that will give you this grain. Yeah? Because when you try to transfer it, when you try to articulate, then you have to see, what is this line? How many lines are there? What, you know, what, how do you get a deeper shading? What, right? what is the, the grain? What is it different? And you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, you're looking. Am I making sense? Yeah? So the easiest way to awaken up, to be fascinated with any concept that you know, is teach, be an artist. Draw it on another human being's awareness. Yeah? He is growing and you're growing. That's the easiest one to use. Number seven is that realize, in order to get you to do this work, realize that unless you take a piece of wisdom and live with it, you haven't, not only you haven't even begun, but you don't really understand. Love is an emotion of pleasure. Do you want pleasure? Unless you love people, unless you're working at it. That means you are seriously impaired in understanding. Yeah. So start all over again, trying to understand why aren't you using this. 
And number eight is the best way, an easy way for continued growth in Torah, which is wisdom, and in wisdom and living, is keep notes and rework them every month. If you have this definition of love, and it makes sense, for goodness sake, don't wait until you're, you're 50 and you remember, hey, uh, you know, I once, what was it that? Use it every month. At least go over it. Say, am I getting it? Do I have love? Am I using it? Do I understand it? Is it a pleasure? Is that right? And you will grow. You will go up the steps. And this was a Jewish consciousness thing. You reviewed everything you knew every month. Unless you knew so darn much, then you reviewed it every year. But not, not longer than a year. Number nine is that the beginning of wisdom, when you really appreciate what wisdom is about, is to know and to recognize how little we understand, how little we know about living. When you get that feeling, then that's the beginning of wisdom. That's, that's when you appreciate that wisdom is really life value, is more important than money. Everybody will tell you wisdom is more important than money, right? Which is more important, to understand what life is about or to have a lot of boats, a lot of cars? Nonsense. You've got to understand what life is about, right? But the beginning of really appreciating, you've got to understand what life is about, is when you realize how little we know about living, how little we study, how little we appreciate Number 10 is that the very worst is to say, I know you can't know. That's the very worst. Don't catch yourself saying such a thing. You can't define love. You can't define happiness. You can't teach me how to be happy. You can't prove that there's a God. You can't know that you know. You can't. <laughs> That's the worst. You know? That's taking ignorance and institutionalizing it. <laughs> how do you know you can't know? <laughs> when somebody tells you, I'll define love, or I'll teach you something you don't know, the natural way is to say, my friend, you got something, put it on the table, let me consider it. Isn't that natural? Why in the world should you defend ignorance and say it can't be done because I've never heard it done? So if I've never heard it done before, then it must be that it can't be done because you know everything, because you're satiated. Number 11 is that every human being, a Jew, would wake up in the morning and you know the first thing that he would say, which means, thank God I'm alive. Don't be bored with living. Uh -uh. Not another day is coming. Uh -uh. No, no. Appreciate the thrill of living. Thank God I'm alive. That's the first thing. That's the way to start. But then the rabbis go on to prescribe a whole series of bichot hashacha, the thanks, the blessings of the morning. And we thank God for giving us understanding and for giving us eyes and for giving us our ability to move and for giving us clothes, etc. throughout the whole thing. So that you don't take things for granted. You don't take having shoes for granted. Number 12 is that Jewish consciousness was that every human being, we have the definition of free will. The common denominator of free will. What does it mean, common denominator? In Judaism, we say he's a God of all humanity. He wants all human beings to make it, to, have, to make it to love, to make it to meaning, to good, to pleasure. If you have children, you want, if you had a hundred children, you want them all to do it, right? The Almighty loves all humanity. So he gave us the wherewithal. What, is, what does a hot and tot do in, in Australia? Or uh, a guy who's born in Red China? Or a fellow who's born in Voodoo Land in Haiti? How does he find reality? In Judaism, we say the common denominator of free will is whether or not a human being will take the choice of asking himself, what am I living for? What do I really want out of life? Bottom line, or oh, he'll take that for granted. Any human being, no matter where he's born, if he'll ask himself, so what do I want? All right, I want money. Why? So I can have securities. Why? So I can do what I want. Why? What do I want to do? I want pleasure. Which pleasure? Well, I want... Uh, frustrated. You have to have guts to keep at it. But that's the common denominator. Anybody who will do it every night before he goes to sleep, ask himself, bottom line, so what do I want? What am I really living for? Sure, I've got to go to college, because I've got to get a degree, because I've got to get a job, because I've got to earn money, because I've got to buy food, because I've got to eat, because I've got to live. 
But what am I living for? We get caught up a lot of times in doing things, and we don't know where we're doing it, where we're going, what difference it's going to make for us. You follow? At least 10 minutes every night, ask yourself, bottom line, end of the road, what are you living for? Any human being that will do that and won't get complacent about it, bored about it, and give up, will be a great human being. B of this is, at the very least, grow up. You know, when you were a kid, you wanted to be a fireman, right? Or did you want to be a baseball star? Or did you want to be a, a, a movie magnet? Or did you want to be a professor? Or did you want to have a, a family and kids? Yeah, that's the, the level. That's it. What else is there to live? Well, they just grow up. You know, mature. So, see if this is, always be ready to restudy, renegotiate, reappreciate your relationship with your parents, your relationship with society, your relationship with yourself. And what you're doing with life. Is tennis the greatest thing? Yeah. Don't wait until you're sick and tired of it. You know? But is that the, the, the greatest pleasure you can get? Don't wait until you have a crisis. Yeah. Don't wait until you're 49... Successful practice and decide, really, what I want to do is be an artist. Don't agonize, but keep investigating. Keep upgrading. Number 13 is that appreciate that you've got to watch out for the holy plan syndrome. I have a reservation. You ask a guy, which would you, which would you prefer, to be happy or to be rich? He said, I'd rather be happy. He said, come on, we'll teach you how to be happy. In Judaism, happiness is an obligation. We'll teach you how. We'll give you a definition. We'll give you some drills. It's hard work, but we'll get you into it. At least you live here in a couple of weeks. You're pretty sure you're going to be a happy human being the rest of your life. So stay with us. He says, I'd love to stay, but i sorry, I can't. I have a reservation. The holy plan syndrome. I, I, you know, I plan to leave this Tuesday. But where are you going? Well, I was going to visit Greece. Why are you going to Greece? Well, I figured maybe I'll find something to make me happy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, friend, I'm, you know, I teach you how to be happy. Yeah, but I plan to go to Greece. Do you see that? We get, we get into it. Don't get into the holy plans. Somebody focuses you on something that's more valuable. Great. Move over. You are... The decider of your plans, and any time you want to change your plans, it's up to you to change your plans. It's a little frightening that you have to actually make decisions in life. You can't just go on the fact that a decision was made somehow, sometime, somewhere. You know? My travel agent booked me. <laughs> right? Update your plans. Number 14 is that a very important thing, appreciate, don't take for granted your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, renew your first appreciations. And Judaism, we say that whenever you go home, remember when you first went out with your wife. Yeah. That's the way to walk into the house. You get it? Don't take it for granted. You know, no, no. Renew it. That mystery, that power. That, that's the way to walk home. That was your job. And, and the board, and uh, no, 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 take a walk around the block, reconstitute an awakening, a first appreciation, and then go home. Well, the same thing you should do when you go to work. Yeah? What was your plans when you first started? No, when you went into your business. Then we get tired, we, we give up, right? But what was your plan? You're gonna, all right, every time you go to work, get that fresh inset of ambition, of of what you're going to accomplish in your business or in your job or in your... What did you want to do? Reconstitute it. Upgrade it. You know, a little more powerful, right? Know a little more about the... And how are you going to get it done? And get in there with that same enthusiasm. Yeah. Same thing goes if you're playing a game of tennis. Don't, don't, don't get bored. If you're playing it, don't be bored with it. Yeah. That same thrill and the same... What is it that you enjoy? reconstitute and get in there with enthusiasm and verve and, oh, don't play. Number 15 is for wisdom. When you hear a piece of wisdom, 
And you, you've got to judge it. A piece of wisdom, and, see, and you never swallow anything from anyone. You have to say, is that the definition of love? Is it true that it's an emotion? Is it true that you can be a lover? If you perceive that that is the truth, then for goodness sake, wake up. Don't go into your rut. You've learned something. The world has changed. Number 16, for living. It's important. And for living, you forget failures. Forget your failures. Don't live in your past. In our rabbi statement, we say that a person who has made mistakes and who's into bad habits shouldn't worry about guilt or and guilt is no good at all. He shouldn't even worry about regretting. Just start as if today is the first day you were born, fresh. Do you get that? How do you want to live? Describe how you want to live and go out and live that way. But what about all the things I've done wrong? No, 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 no. Just start doing right. Just start doing right. But I can't. I, I always fight with my parents. No. <laughs> you always fight with your parents? No, no, no. From now on, no fighting with your parents. What do you want to do with your parents? You want to communicate? Yeah, but they insult me. All right, so you want to keep your, you want to keep your temper? You want to be sweet to them even though they insult you? You want to let it roll off your back and tell them, Dad, I love you. And, uh, really, I get hurt when you say, I mean, what do you want to do? From now on, do it right. Never mind, but uh, yesterday, I mean, it doesn't work. I, I... <clears throat> You're born today. What would you be doing today? Opens you up. Number 17 is that for a great leap forward into Ain Omega Siva Tamudu, into living, make a list of all your I can'ts. All the things that you can't do. I can't change, I can't control my temper, I can't speak to people, I can't charm them, I can't love them, I can't... All the things that you can't. I can't live in peace with my parents, I, I can't talk to strangers, I can't learn a language, I can't... All of them can't change the world. Anybody here can change the world? Nah, can't change the world. Right? All of them. Put in a list. I mean, everybody's got... is carrying around at least a thousand I can'ts. Right? Yeah? So make a list of at least 200. That's the assignment for today. You work out half an hour four times during a day, you'll find 200 I can'ts that are holding you back. Right? Okay? B of that is sort them out. Is it I can't? Or I don't want to? Or I don't feel like it? Or I don't know how? Or I don't have confidence that I will see it through? You see? Don't say I can't. You know darn well that 99.9 .9 of them is surely I can. Yeah? I just don't feel like it. See if this is. Keep your list and study them. And get advice as to how to get it into I can. I really can do it. And I want to. And I feel like it. And I'm going to undertake it. And I'll do it. Just get one of them into that and you, you have a different lifestyle. One of those lists that you thought you can't. Any one of them. Even if it's ice skate. Yeah? But just change that. Talking to strangers. A simple one. Something that you said, I can't do. Public speaking. But once you learn in reality that not only you can do what you thought you can, but you want to and you will and you decide to and you do it, you've opened up a new, new dimensions in life. You're walking with your back straight. Now you got the measure of the enemy. Number 18. For living, for living, see how silly human beings are. Start with your parents. Are they still treating you as their, as their baby boy? Huh? But see that people have a set. They make an impression. They've learned someone and they figure that's it. And they don't update. They, they're stuck with something, right? Mark Twain said, he wrote, that when I went to college, I thought my father was an old fuddy, didn't know what living was about, he was an ignoramus, etc. And while I was away in college, four years in college, and I came back, I was amazed to find out how much the old man learned while I was away. Right. How much his old man learned while he was in college. Right, this is a guy who grew up. He saw that what he thought his father was, didn't know was what his father knew. Am I making sense? Yeah? 
I'm going to make sure that you grow up, that you change. Just like you don't want your parents to treat you as kids, don't you treat your parents as either uh, uh, God figures or as ignoramuses or as not with the new generation, you follow? Reestimate all the time. Where are people? What do you think they are? Don't treat them as kids if they've grown up. And don't treat them with your concept of the all-powerful if they're not all-powerful. Yeah? You were a kid. You had one opinion. Now you've learned something. They're real human beings. They've got problems, etc. Realize that. Yeah? Don't continue with childhood syndromes of manipulating, of crying in order to get what you want, of resentment, of dependency. Grow up. Number 19 is that for living, don't give up on yourself. That's the most important aspect of it all. Your problems, your ambitions, your attitudes towards life, always relearn it. Your attitudes towards living, what are you going to do? What have you given up? What is your understanding? What are your goals? Don't give up on problems. I can't deal with problems. That's for living. It's of prime importance. Whatever it is, give me ten plans, another ten plans. Another ten plans until you get something done. You want something accomplished? You want to make your parents happy? Okay, you keep working on it for a year. Ten plans every month, you'll get them to be tickled pink with. Am I making sense? Whatever you want to do, look at it as just a question of finding the right way of getting it done. If you want to fly like a bird, I don't suggest you invest too much time in it, but I, my confidence is with you if you stick it out. <laughs> I don't know how, <laughs> but I don't suggest you, you tackle that one. You, you follow? But there's such a thing. You know that you can make your parents pleased with you. You know that you can make your wife happy. You know you can help your children grow. You know that you can communicate with friends. You know that, right? So don't give up. Solve them. Ten plans. Just keep on learning it, and it gets done. All right. Why do we need this? Why is this a necessary thing in order to do in order to live, look, fat men can't run. Did you ever hear that expression? If you're a fat man, you figure you're complacent. You know what life is about. You never know what life is about. It's the lean and hungry fighters that become the champions. If you understand I haven't even begun, then you'll know what living is about. But in as much as you satiate, you're bored with living already. <laughs> you haven't, you haven't free of a chance. Number two is that it's the only way to get rid of prejudices. The only way of getting rid of the prejudices is to realize that you haven't begun. Otherwise, we're, we're locked. We're locked into an opinion. But when we say, come, you know, I haven't begun, so you start looking at it, you analyze it, you find your mistakes. By really restudying what, you're, what you think you know, you'll find that you made mistakes. It's the only way, really, of getting rid of prejudices on your own. You can get rid of prejudices by having people come and get your attention and show you differently, etc. But on your own, is restudy the issues and you'll find out that you don't have a leg to stand on. How do you know that the world is round? That's what the people had to do to figure out how do you know that the world is flat, is wrong. <laughs> Where are you coming from? How do you know it? Am I making sense? So how do you know the world is round? Well, you better check it out. Don't take it for granted. Number three is it takes time and effort to mature. No human being is instantly mature. When you're a kid, you're a kid. You can't possibly understand the oneness of God, the eternity. Yeah? It takes time to, <laughs> to mature. Human beings mature. It takes time for us to assimilate an idea. Now, if we're stuck with our original conception, if we don't understand, if we're satiated, if we are complacent with our original conception, we never, we never grow up. We look at God as an old fuddy-duddy figure with a white beard. And then that's what we thought of when we were 10, and that's what we stuck with. Yeah? If you constantly realize that you have to upgrade, you have to learn, then you'll, you'll mature and you'll grow. With your growth, everything will grow. There's so much to life we haven't begun. And the only way is not to be complacent with what you know. Thank you. You've been listening to the 48 Ways to Wisdom 